What's up, guys? Rick here with your DFS preview for this week's U.S. Open. That's right. Probably my favorite event on the schedule at definitely my favorite course on the planet. I've got so much great experience at Torrey Pines. It holds a very special place in my heart. I cannot wait to see it host another U.S. Open. So I'm absolutely thrilled to jump into the preview this week. But before we do so, I've got to do a couple of important housekeeping items. I've, I've narrowed this down, so I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Uh, everything that you see in these videos is from my website. It's rickrungood.com. It is a golf data website only focused on golf, a lot of data and information to help your research process. I like it. I believe that you will like it too. If you are into golf cards, uh, I've got a, a great news for you. I forgot that I pre-ordered five boxes of these Upper Deck SP Game Used cards. This is the higher end Upper Deck release for this year. There are apparently just the entire pack is basically hits, memorabilia, autographs, all that stuff. Um, so I'm coming out of my card-breaking retirement for one night only. I am going to break all five boxes Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern time. And I know that that is on the later side, but there will be, it'll be available forever. It'll always live on YouTube. You can watch it later. If you want to get involved in this break like we've done in the past, here's how it's going to work. Because, because there's only one pack in each one of these boxes and sometimes there's four cards in there and sometimes there's six it, it it did not make sense for me to sell spots or sell entire boxes or anything like that and they're expensive so I figured I'm just going to raffle every single card off I'm going to open all five boxes on Wednesday evening and I'm going to raffle off every single card in there it should be about 25 cards with maybe 18 to 20 of them something like that being memorabilia or autographs or something of that nature and like we've done in the past I'm just opening it up as a raffle you can Venmo me, you can PayPal me, uh, any amount that you want. $10 is 10 entries, $100 is 100 entries, 1,000 is 1,000 entries. That's that's what we're doing. We've done it before with great success. I'll have all the information down in the description below, and then I will, again, officially retire from live breaking cards and shipping them all out and everything like that. I, I rarely ask for this, but since it's a major week, I'm going to ask for you to like the video. I'm going to ask for you to make sure that you are subscribed. And in return, I am going to offer up some subscriptions to rickrungood.com. Now, if you follow along every single week, you know that I give out monthly subscriptions each and every week on this DFS preview, but for major championships, I ratchet it up. So I'm going to give away yearly subscriptions to rickrungood.com. And there are two ways that you can enter. If you are on YouTube, like the video, make sure you're subscribed and comment below with who is going to win the U S open. The other way to win, the easier way to win, is to go to the podcast version of this show. It'll be linked in the description. Leave a five-star rating and review. Say something nice about the show and leave me your Twitter handle. That will get you entered into a draw for yearly subscriptions to rickrungood.com. If you do both, you have two chances of winning. I think that's everything. I'm, I'm so stoked for this week. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Let's not waste any more time. Let's jump into the U.S. Open. Here it is, Torrey Pines, my favorite course on the planet. And technically, there are two courses on site. So let's just get this all out there. Uh, the Farmers Insurance Open was played at Torrey Pines earlier this year for that event. They use both the North and the South course with three rounds being played at the South course. The South course is what we will be playing this week in full. There is no use of the North course. So keep that in mind. Uh, keep in mind that it's somewhat rare to get a course that we see for a regular event and then also for a major championship in the same year and there will be a few I, I i shouldn't say a few there's going to be differences the biggest one is that this is a par 71 so what they have done is they've taken hole number six here's the scorecard i'm showing to you on youtube right now they've taken hole number six which is a par five and they've turned it into a par four that makes it 35 on the front 36 on the back for a total of 71 it probably just means the the uh, par par is a social construct okay it doesn't matter the fewest amount of strokes over this course is going to win the golf tournament but it means that the winning score is going to be much much lower we know that the US Open would love to get it to like even par something like that um 
The other thing people will complain about is that they should have turned 18 into the par four, but there's a pond up front uh, of, of the green. That would be a really tough ask for guys to be hitting long irons into that. And also the last time that we played this event was 20 or we played the U S open here was 2008 tiger played it the full three shots made like they're not going to miss the opportunity for somebody to do that again. So 18 stays as a par five, uh, notably of course the, the rough, the rough is always an issue at Torrey Pines South. Let me tell you from experience, it is this, it is just this devilish, uh, thick Kakuya rough. And it just absolutely eats up your club face. It's, you know, for someone like me, it's a stroke penalty essentially for hitting the ball in the rough. Uh, what we saw at winged foot is uh, they, they've crossed the line. Like there is a fine line between rewarding players uh, 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 for hitting the fairway or penalizing them for, for missing the, for missing the fairway and uh, winged foot cross the line because no one could hit any fairways. So everyone was playing out of the rough, which is why Bryson won because when everyone is playing out of the rough and you have the club head speed and all that jazz, you can move it out of there. So expect that thick rough all week long. And then finally, uh, the, these Poana greens, uh, Poa is a, a devilish surface. It buds throughout the day. It grows throughout the day. Now you of course can tamp that down, but, uh, you will see if we get that worm cam this week, you're going to see balls bobble all the way to the hole. And quite honestly, it frustrates a lot of golfers. So if you wanted to, for example, go into the Holy grail, sort by the best putters on Poana over the last six years and see what the names of those golfers are. I don't think that's a bad idea. Patrick Rogers, number one, by the way, for guys with a pretty good sample size. Um, so I don't think that is a bad idea because it is such a tricky surface. Now, also, uh, the undulation, the brakes, I find, and, and I believe they are very tricky because everything in theory, should be going to the ocean. Sometimes they do not uh, look as if they are going that way, yet they still are. So I think experience also matters around Torrey Pines. And then if we go down and we look at the course correlation for U.S. Opens, for U.S. Opens, so we can do this two ways. We can do a lot of things two ways this week. For U.S. Opens, the strongest correlators to success are, believe it or not, Strokes game putting. There are only two events in which strokes game putting uh, was more important over the last dozen years. Driving accuracy was next, and that starts to make sense. It doesn't mean just being accurate is good enough or just being long is good enough, but playing out of the fairway at U.S. Opens has strongly correlated to success, essentially outside of winged foot, right? Because that was, it crossed the line. What we can also do on this tool is we can change this to the Farmers Insurance Open and we can look at Torrey Pines specifically and you'll notice something else there. Strokes gain putting, driving accuracy, the two most important stats. They are not as strongly correlated as the U.S. Open. And again, that rotates all over the place, but usually set up similarly. But it is notable that it is also the same two stats. It kind of blew my mind when we did that. So keep all of that in mind as we go through this. And also keep in mind that if you are using the Holy Grail and you want to look at uh, golfers' performances, not only at US Opens, but also at Farmers, you can do that. So what you could do is you could say, change the tournament to uh, the US Open, which I believe I have here. Okay. So US Open, and then also change it to farmers as well hold control or command if you're on a mac click farmers and now you've got all of the history for the u.s open and the farmers insurance open in one spot here is the cheat sheet at rickrungood.com and there are five golfers over ten thousand dollars john rom jordan spieth dustin johnson bryson decambo and brooks kepka and oh boy is are there things to discuss here let's see john rom will certainly be one of the most popular golfers on the slate as we get with major championships plenty of soft pricing plenty of opportunities to get john rom in your lineups he of course 
had a six-shot lead at Memorial the last time that we saw him. Doesn't get credit for that victory because he has to WD after the third round. And now he is out of the COVID protocols. He is en route to, um, to Torrey Pines if he is not there already by the time you are watching this. By the time you're watching this, he's almost certainly there already. And this is a course that he has absolutely dominated at in his career. So again, don't be fooled by this missed cut at the Memorial. Look at his strokes gain data. Gained 21 strokes on the field in three rounds. Three rounds. It's unbelievable stuff. Uh, had finished eighth at the PGA Championship in his start before that. He's been absolutely dominant with the driver. That is such a key attribute, uh, of course, being able to hit the driver long and straight, gain as many strokes as you possibly can. And he started to fix the putter. This is really special stuff. And then if we go to what he has done at the Farmers Insurance Open, so this is Torrey Pines. Here's his five trips. Win, second, fifth, seventh, and 29th. If we remove everybody else, or if we add, uh, remove John Rahm and just look at the Farmers Insurance Open, I actually thought he was going to be the best player here. He's not since 2015, but he's gaining 1.9 strokes per round. Tony Finau actually has been better. And... Roy McElroy has been better for guys that have a large enough sample size, at least double digits number of rounds played. Jordan Spieth at 10,900, I find incredibly compelling, not necessarily in all good ways. I think this is going to be a true test for Jordan Spieth. Getting him in a birdie fest at Valero, uh, all good. When you are reliant on hitting fairways, Oh boy, uh, Jordan Spieth, 176th in driving accuracy this year. Uh, he has made a habit of extracting himself from some really awkward and nasty situations, and he will be fully tested in that at Torrey Pines. You look at what he's done in the last handful of years at Torrey Pines, at the Farmers Insurance Open, hasn't been great. Missed the cut in two of his last four. 55th and 35th. Now, he hasn't played it every single year, but he's played it the last three it's not great. It's not a great record because it requires you to be playing out of the fairway. Now, we could argue this is a completely different player, uh, and it kind of is. Right, basically, right after Farmers is when he started his unbelievable stretch of golf, and he's still been scorching hot ever since. But this will be the real true test. I've been all in on Jordan Spieth uh, as this ascension, as this return to, to great play has been going on. I'm very hesitant this week. I think he's going to have to really be on top of his game. He's going to have to be in the fairway. That's that's the key for him. The next, th I guess the next three guys, DJ, Brooks Kepka, and Bryson DeChambeau, uh, I think there's a lot, a lot of question marks here. And these are the golfers that will win somebody a million dollars. If you can get them right, you can probably get them at a low ownership. We'll see as the week goes on. But DJ at 10,700, I'm probably more optimistic than... Uh, most are from his from his play at Congaree last week. It, it, it wasn't exactly pretty on the weekend, but through three rounds, he was gaining strokes in every single category. He was back to driving the ball great. The putter was cooperating. Sunday was pretty ugly at times. I don't know how much he wanted to be there, but that feels like a pretty good leverage spot for DJ, who in his last five U.S. Opens has three top six finishes and, of course, the victory. Uh, Bryson is, uh, to me, at the moment, pretty lost in his game. You know, we can look him up here and see what he's what he's been up to since his um, since his victory. So here we go. So the good news is he's constantly gaining off the tee. The bad news is uh, he doesn't know where it's going on approach. The putter has been has been really sour, and I don't want to take a, a poor putter to uh, to Torrey Pines and say have at it on these on these Poana greens. Now the 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 one thing about Bryson is if is if this turns into winged foot, watch out. I mean, this is he he is literally built and designed for a US Open. Very thick rough. Nobody hits the fairway. Hard conditions. He this is what he's designed for. So I would love to wait a little bit as the week goes on, see if we can get um, you know, maybe like how wide the greens are, see how it's playing, see if it's gonna be a, a winged foot situation, or see if it's if it's not. So uh I'm 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 waiting, I'm holding my tongue on Bryson. Um, but this should be what he's designed for. And then Brooks Kepka. 10,100, man, I don't, I, I really don't know. So missed the cut last week. Good news. Good news is four point, he gained more strokes ball striking than a lot of guys through two rounds. So he 
gain strokes off the tee, gain strokes on approach. He was horrible around the greens and he was horrible on, on, on the putter. Now, what we have seen from Brooks is sometimes he can flip that putter back pretty quickly. Let's see what he's done recently. Yeah, so he loses four and a half strokes putting at Byron Nelson. He was a positive putter, barely, but positive uh, in his next start at the PGA Championship the very next week. Um, if you go back to the 3M Open last year, he lost five strokes. He was terrible the next week with the putter, still finished second, kind of started to turn around after that. So he doesn't always go through long sustained struggles with the putter, which has me more optimistic than most. So if you probably want me to rank these guys, the bottom three guys, I think I would go... Man, this is a lot of it has to do with the course setup, but I think I would go Bryson, Brooks, DJ. It's very, very close. I mean, Brooks is cheaper and gives me reason to be optimistic and probably comes in at a lower ownership. So that's that's probably the route that I would go. The 9K range is incredibly compelling. Uh, Roy McElroy, $9,900. This is probably the leverage spot. Um, could you forego the entire 10 K? I don't, I don't know that for sure. It's, it's pretty soft pricing. You probably don't have to, you can probably get a 10 K guy and Rory McElroy. But if you noticed, you know, when I did this earlier, right, I believe what I did is, uh, I took everybody in this field and I said, U S open and farmers. And when you do that, I think you get a lot of, of Rory McElroy. Yeah, you do. So in his 24 rounds, he's gaining 1.8 strokes per round. It's the it's the one, two, three, four, fifth best of anybody who has played in at least five of these. If you just go with Torrey Pines, you just go Farmers Insurance Open. He's the best of anybody with double digit rounds. Uh, he finished in his last three trips, fifth in 2019, third in 2020, 16th in 2021. So. That that feels great. If we just look at his recent results, um, we're, we're getting kind of a, uh, I don't want to say a weird version of Rory, but there's 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 still questions here. You know, he wins at Quail Hollow immediately after the Masters, right? His, his first start after signing on with the new swing coach and all that stuff. Uh, but we haven't seen him drive the ball like that since at the PGA Championship or at Muirfield Village. The good news for me is this column right here, the approach game. Because if you remember, after the restart last year, he was essentially pedestrian with his irons and wedges. Those are much better, which gives me real optimism for Rory McIlroy. I'm not going to talk through every single player, but I mean, a lot of these guys are very, very important. You know, Justin Thomas, again, it, there are so many great players at the top of this leaderboard. It is really hard to split hairs. And when you start splitting them, you have to, you have to take some stands in, in some places. And I think one of those places that I'm going to have to take a stand on is, is Justin Thomas. He hasn't been particularly good with results recently since his win at the players. He doesn't have another top call it 10. Uh, his last couple of starts, he missed the cut at the PGA Championship, 40th at the Charles Schwab, 42nd at the Memorial. Uh, the putter, always a huge question mark. The other thing that I think is low-key kind of worrisome about JT is he doesn't have as much experience at Torrey Pines as everybody else. I think the last time he played it was 2015. He missed the cut. He played it once before that, had a top 10. But if you don't play a golf tournament in five years, I just think there's, I think there's subtleties. I think maybe there's a reason he wasn't playing it. Maybe he didn't think it was a particularly good fit for him. And I just think if you're gonna if you're gonna start splitting hairs, that would be a negative to to JT. All right. Um, the rest of this 9K range, I'll try to be quick. Xander Shoffley, I imagine, is going to be incredibly popular. He's played in four U.S. Opens. He's never finished worse than sixth. He had trouble at Torrey Pines in his career until the start this year. Uh, he he finished runner up. So Xander is certainly in play. Uh, Morikawa, if he can figure out the putter, right? That's always the question. It's a little bit worrisome on on Poana Greens, but uh, hey, he's great. He's great from tee to green. I think the most interesting guy might be Patrick Reed. Um, on paper, a U.S. Open shouldn't be a really good spot for him. But in the last four years, he's made four cuts. He has three top 13 finishes. He seems to find a way to get it done at U.S. Opens because he plays out of the fairway often, or at least he has a go-to shot that he can hit off the tee. The other thing about Patrick Reed is um, he is an excellent putter uh, in, in general, but he's also great on, on Poana, right? So if we go back and we do everybody in this field for the last six years and we look at, at strokes gained putting on Poana, there's a lot of guys with small sample sizes. Patrick Rogers is the best. He has 48 rounds. Patrick Reed is second. 
60 second rounds. I guess I guess you'd call him number one of anybody who has uh, as many rounds as he does. And his last two, uh, I, I guess this is his last two starts on Poana Greens, he won at the Farmers and he won at Mexico, um, which is exactly what you're looking for. Certainly helps that he won this event earlier uh, earlier this year. Also helps that he um, is a big game hunter, right? Six of his nine wins, I think, are a major, the Masters, uh, WGCs, playoff events, Tournament of Champions. I mean, it, it's I, I think he's really interesting. And we'll see what the general public does with him because they certainly don't like to roster Patrick Reed. So we'll keep a close eye on him at an even 9,000. As we jump down to the $8,000 range, this is the range where I think we start to get into real value, especially with the pricing this week, but also in terms of other formats. This is the range that I think wins much more than what the odds might dictate or imply that they do. I think this is a really incredible range for not only here on, on DraftKings, but for uh, odds makers, or if you're playing something like stock market DFS, if you're playing on the jock market, because most people are going to want to spend their money up top and, and, and buy shares of those golfers. But I think this is where the real value starts. So let me take you through a couple of quick buy low and sell high options from this general range. I find Sam Burns to be an incredible case study this week. And when you're playing in a format where sentiment matters, I think that he is certainly a buy low candidate. Remember the PGA Championship? He was coming off a win at Valspar, a runner up at the Byron Nelson, and everybody played him at the PGA Championship. And he withdrew with a back injury just a few holes in. Well, that's certainly going to be on the forefront of everyone's mind. But you have to look at the larger set of results for Sam Burns. He's played well a lot on tour this year, including almost winning at Riviera. That is another difficult course with Poana Greens, the win at Valspar that I already mentioned. And if you look at his skill sets, what he does is he hits the ball very far. That comes in handy at a U.S. Open. Is he going to have to hit more fairways? Very likely, but what happened the last time he played at Torrey Pines? He was in the final group with Patrick Reed on Sunday. He played great until he immediately four-putted the first hole and kind of played himself out of it on Sunday, but certainly has, has enough good vibes and played well enough around Torrey Pines already this year. I'm trying to target him at $6.50 during IPO. That's per share, meaning I'm asking Sam Burns to finish inside the top 25. If he does that, I will break even with the ability to earn all all the way up to $25 to share on Sam Burns if he wins the golf tournament. And of course, every spot on the way up paying out a different amount. Shane Lowry not getting nearly the amount of respect that he should be. He enters this week 60-1 to to win the golf tournament, and you look at some of his recent results. An 8th place finish at the Players' Championship. That was TPC Sawgrass. A T9 at the RBC Heritage. That was Harbortown. And then he comes in this week fresh off of two more top six finishes. A T4 at Kiowa and a T6 at Mirfield Village. Think about those golf courses. You can throw out Harbortown, say it's easy, do whatever. It's kind of tricky. But the other three are legitimate, stout, major championship-esque courses. And now Lowry goes to Torrey Pines. And I think on paper, most people are going to think that's not going to be a great setup for him. But would you have said that any of these other places where he's finished inside the top 10 would be great setups for him? I I'm not sure. He just continues to gain strokes on approach. He continues to tap into that short game magic. And I'm willing to actually spend more on Lowry than I am on Sam Burns this week. I'm willing to go up to $7 a share, which which would put his break-even finishing position at 22nd. That's the point in which I would break even, and anything up from there, I would make some money. But Shane Lowry certainly someone who has my full attention this week. And then on the flip side, there are certainly golfers that we are going to have to draw a line on this week. There's so many great guys at the top, but Justin Thomas concerns me a little bit. Since his victory at the Players' Championship, he does not have another top 10 finish. We know that when he does miss with the driver, he usually misses pretty large. He can he can miss a lot of fairways. He can end up playing out of this super, super thick Torrey Pines rough. And we know that his putter is the thing that acts up at times. And these Poana greens, especially 
especially as the day goes on and they start to bud, they get more difficult and they get more tricky. There are a lot of putts out there that look like they do not go to the ocean and they do. There's just a lot of tricky situations and I think experience matters and Justin Thomas doesn't have as much experience around Torrey Pines as I would even like to see. He's played the Farmers Insurance Open twice, but neither of them were in the last five years. You go back to 2014, that was the first time he played it, finished T10, that's all good. 2015, missed the cut and hasn't played since. I mean, this is, there's going to be some different things about the course. There's going to be some subtleties about the course that I think experience matters. So JT, when you start splitting hairs at the top of the board, uh, concerns me. I'm willing to pay $8 a share on him, which would make his break-even finishing position 18th I think he's going to be more expensive than that which means I probably will not have many shares of Justin Thomas and it's with a heavy heart that John Rahm becomes becomes my other sell high option and let me be very clear I I love John Rahm this week but so will everyone else and when you're playing a game where sentiment matters and you have to put your money where your mouth is I think I'm going to miss out on John Rahm there are only one golfer, there's one golfer, his name is John Rahm, who is averaging over $10 a share in the IPO in the jock market. He's averaging $10.07, which means oftentimes he's going much more expensive than that. Eleven fifty dollars at Byron Nelson, ten fifty dollars at the Wells Fargo Championship, ten forty four dollars per share at the Masters. And I just think that when you combine the story, the last time that we saw him being up six shots at the Memorial, um, how dominant he was, now he goes to a place where he's had unbelievable amount of success. I'm willing to pay $10.50. I don't think I'm going to be able to get there on him. I think he's going to be more expensive than that. And, and when you're starting to ask these golfers, and this goes for a lot of different formats, when you're starting to ask them, they have to finish inside the top 10 to return you money, which would be the case at $10.50. That is a tough ask for any golfer in this field. There's not a lot of juice to be squeezed out of that situation. So I feel John Rahm will not be a significant por portion of my portfolio this week. If you want to get involved in Stock Market DFS, download Jock Market, deposit, use the code RICK. That will get you the biggest deposit bonus they have available, which is a full $50 or up to $50. If you deposit $20, you get $20, $50, you get $50. And uh, be sure to join us Wednesday evening on the Rick Run Good YouTube channel for the Jock Market Power Hour, where we spend the final hour of Wednesday evening, the final hour of that IPO, breaking everything down bidding on golfers. It'll be a lot of fun and I'll see you there. All right. So getting back into this 8K range, uh, I hate to say it, but Tony Finau, I mean, he has been electric at at farmers, right? So, so here's everybody at farmers. Uh, if we just sort by strokes gain total, once you get to any size, anything over Rory's 12 rounds, Finau's 28. He's got 28 rounds. He's got more rounds than most guys, and he's averaging nearly two strokes gained per round. His last six years, he has not finished outside the top 24. Runner-up earlier this year, sixth last year, 13th, 6th, 4th, 18th, 24th. I mean... I get why he would have success, right? He is a great driver of the golf ball. He can get hot and, and, and get dialed in with the irons, and the putter is a giant question mark. Um, but he's had good success here. So uh, the good news about Finau is at this price, he doesn't have to win because if you're asking him to win, you might be a little bit worried about that. Uh, so uh, at least at this point, you know, if he finishes top five, which is certainly within his range of outcomes, he is a huge win at $8,900. At $8,600, it's hard to not love Will Zalatoris. This will be his fourth major. He has finished inside the top 10 in all three of his previous majors, which is crazy. If we look at his golfer profile, the stats are staggering for a guy who is not technically uh, a full member. He will become a full member next year. Third in strokes gained approach. Third in strokes gained from Tita Green. Eighth in Eagles. 13th in scoring average. 22nd in driving distance and strokes gained total. Does he hit a lot of fairways? No, but that hasn't stopped him, right? It hasn't stopped him from putting up really great results at difficult golf courses. Let's look up Zalatoris. And I want to do two things with Zalatoris here. I want to look up his just general results because if you point out the courses that he has had success on, it's staggering. So since the U.S. Open, that's when he um, came up. He top 10. He got another start. He got another start. He, he eventually would 
earn enough points to to get it uh, to become a special temporary member. So sixth at Wings Foot, very difficult course. I'm skipping a lot of these. Seventh at Farmers earlier this year, Torrey Pines, the place we're going back to. Fifteenth at Riviera, another difficult course with Poana Greens. Twenty uh, second at the Concession, unbelievably difficult. Tenth at Bay Hill, very hard. Second, a runner up finish at Augusta National, and an eighth place finish at Kiowa Island. The guy gets it done. And the other thing I will show you is this. I will clear Will Zalatoris' name, and I just want to show you all the best players on the PGA Tour since Zalatoris made his debut, which was that U.S. Open. We sort by strokes gain total. We get rid of the small sample size guys. And Will Zalatoris, and we sort by strokes gain approach. That was the one thing that I forgot to do. Uh, here are the guys who have been better on approach than, than Zalatoris. Morikawa, Hoffman, Thomas, Henley and Corey Connors. That's it. The best of the best in terms of ball striking. He's been better than Jordan Spieth. He's been better than John Rahm. He's been better than Tony Finau. Brooks Kepka, Patrick Cantley, everybody else. All of those wins. So uh, seemingly just a matter of time for Will Zalatoris. I don't think he's going to win this week, but he can certainly contend. He can certainly make a lot of noise. The rest of this AK range, pretty standard. As much as I love Hideki, it's so difficult to watch. Uh, as much as I love Webb Simpson, the game hasn't been as sharp, or at least he just hasn't played as much. But I, I don't write off Webb Simpson at any course anymore. So if someone tells you, oh boy, this course is too big for Webb Simpson, that has stopped being the case. Um, same with Daniel Berger. You know, Berger has played uh, relatively well enough at U.S. Opens recently. Uh, you know, he finds enough fairways to, to kind of make a little bit of noise. And then Louis Oosthuizen, who, uh, I mean, this guy's unbelievable. You know, there's the, the, the great play that he's had, uh, the, the great run that we've seen from him at U.S. Opens. I mean, look at his last five years. Third, seventh, 16th, 23rd, 23rd. Louis Oosthuizen just, if it's a big-time event, if it's hard, he seems to get his name near the top of the leaderboard. 7K range, really compelling. A couple of guys stand out to me. Uh, there's a lot of great names here, but but a handful stand out in particular. Sam Burns. Oh boy, what do we do with Sam Burns? He is seventy seven hundred dollars. The last time everybody got all hot and bothered about him was the PGA Championship because he was coming off his victory and his runner up finish, and then he withdrew after five holes because he had a back injury and burned everyone. But but wouldn't we argue? This would be a great a setup for Sam Burns. He hits it long off the tee, right? 28th in driving distance. He gains uh, uh, about a quarter of a stroke per round off the tee, 46th on tour. He is uh, a great or good enough with the irons. He's, you know, I'd say he's great. He's 14th in strokes gained approach. He nearly won at Riviera, which I think is, again, very difficult course on the West Coast with Poana Greens. That's a pretty decent comp. And also, if you needed a better comp, how about he was in the final group at this event in January with Patrick Reed? Now, he immediately four putts the first green and plays himself out of it, and his result looks a lot worse than it actually was. But it, like, wouldn't we just love all of that if we just put it together and say, hey, I have this guy who play, has played well at comp courses. He's won. He's contended a lot. The last time that he played uh, on on this course, he finished 18th, although it was actually much better than that through three rounds. Wouldn't we be dying to get this guy? It's Sam Burns. Uh, and again, he might burn us all again. I understand that. Golf is very hard. Golf is very weird. But I have to lay out that, that argument for him. Next is Shane Lowry, a little bit cheaper, $7,600. And I'm not sure if people are really understanding how good Shane Lowry has been recently. So he has gained strokes on approach in every single start since the Players' Championship. That's eight consecutive starts. That gives you an incredibly high floor. And then he's been able to tap into a little bit of short game magic and post some really impressive top 10 finishes. So he top 10s at Harbor Town, which we can we can throw out. It's a I don't care what we do. It's a birdie fest. It's not like this course at all. But an eighth place finish at Sawgrass. That's the Players' Championship. A fourth at Kiowa Island and a sixth in his last start at Mirfield Village. Now these are tough, deep fields and whose name is consistently on the top of the leaderboard? It's Shane Lowry. So uh, he's doing all the right things right now. He's only $7,600. But maybe the guy... I'm most excited about, and I've never said this, so we can record it, we can clip it, we can do whatever. 
Adam Scott. He's $7,400. If you watch this, you know I'm not generally an Adam Scott fan, but I can't really find anything that's wrong at the moment. Uh, we can look at the metrics and we can say it's kind of weird. He's a little bit relying on the putter, which is kind of crazy for Adam Scott. And the ball striking hasn't been as good. But uh, how consistently good has he been? He hasn't played a whole lot, but he's only missed one cut since last year's players so the 2020 remember when basically since the restart he's missed one cut it was at the pga championship uh his most recent start 16th place finish at Mirfield village look at all the places that he's posted his best finishes honda classic that's a very difficult course pga national 10th place finish uh here at tory pines in january very difficult golf course i mean he's just he's just putting it together on hard golf courses and that doesn't even consider that his last win was at Riviera, which again, I really like as a comp course. So uh, I'll say it again because I don't say it often. I really like Adam Scott this week. Matthew Wolf uh, is an incredibly intriguing option at $7,200. I don't think anybody knows what to expect from him. He's been taking time off. He hasn't played in a long time. For him to come back and find success right away at a major championship, uh, I, I think would be a tough ask. But remember what he did at Wingsfoot. He finished runner-up to Bryson. The things that would that would work for Bryson would also work for Wolf. You would have to really be willing to embrace the huge volatility in that. But if you're willing to embrace the huge volatility in that, maybe you can embrace it. $6,000 range. The first name uh, that caught my attention, Cameron Young. If you are not familiar, uh, just won back-to-back -back starts on the Corn Ferry Tour within the last like three or four weeks. So he's, he's playing hot right now. And he does have just the tiniest little bit of experience on the PGA tour. And that experience on the PGA tour, uh, happens to be at Torrey Pines two rounds. So one round at the North course, one round at the South course. We only have the shot link data from the South course, which is good. Cause that's where we're going to be playing this one. Gain 2.7 strokes on the field in that one round. He missed the cut because he couldn't take advantage of the easier North course. But if you're looking for a very small sample uh, flyer from the $6,000 range, a guy who's playing well all over the world or not all over the world, but like at whatever tour he's playing at, Cameron Young, somewhat interesting. $6,800 is also a good price for Johnny Vegas. Uh, here's, here's what's interesting about Vegas. He has one good skill set. And if you're only going to have one good skill set, the skill set that you'd like to have at Torrey Pines is the ability to hit the driver, which is exactly what he does. Fifth in strokes gained off the tee. He's 19th in distance, which of course means that he's a little bit further down in driving accuracy, but he's playing well at the moment. Another great run deep last week at Palmetto, and he's coming off of another top 10 at the Byron Nelson a couple of starts ago. So we're starting to see Vegas turn the game around, and he has a skill set that should lend itself better than a lot of his peers at Torrey Pines. This range is so hard to kind of find differences between. I think there's a couple of things that we can do here in, in the Holy Grail uh, to kind of find some differences between these golfers. So let's just go since the start of 2021, strokes gain total, and see if we can start just finding the guys in the $6,000 range. We already talked about Cam Young. He only has two rounds. Eric Cole is in here. He only has four rounds. Uh, Chan Kim only has eight rounds. Let's find somebody with a bigger sample size. Okay, Vegas would be the first one with a big sample size. We already talked about him. Him. Brendan Steele would be the next. I'm pretty sure he's still, yeah, Steele still, that's hard to say, has not missed a cut in 2021. Now, a couple of his most recent finishes were in the 70s, so it basically finished almost last after making the cup, but he made the cut. Uh, the start of his 2021 was a lot better. He's uh, When he's going well, he's a great ball striker, which is what you'd want to be at Torrey Pines. And actually, the putter's been a lot better recently. That's a place where he can generally lose a ton of strokes, not doing it so much as of late. Grayson Sig would be next, but again, only 10 rounds there. And then Lonto, he has 48 rounds. Unfortunately, a lot of his gains came at the beginning of the year. He's been 
pretty sour recently. He's missed five of his last six cuts. That's going to be uh, tough to kind of expect him to flip the switch a little bit there. So not a whole lot of great options that we did not talk about in that $6,000 range. But if you're looking for more of specialists, let's just sort this by strokes gained approach and start scrolling down until we see golfers in the 6K. Tom Hoagie is the first one. He's $6,700, although... He's missed a bunch of cuts. He's missed, uh, what is that, six of his last seven. And a lot of those gains came earlier in the year. Grayson Sig also here. Bo Hogue, interestingly enough, since the start of 2020, excuse me, since the start of 2021, Bo Hogue has gained strokes off the tee and on approach. That is a pretty good sign. He's coming off a 13th place finish at the Memorial. Missed a ton of cuts before that. I wouldn't hate this. This wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. $6,700. He would definitely differentiate you from the rest of your peers. Not the worst thing I've ever seen. And it would not be a DFS preview if we did not build a model before we got out of here. This is the lineup builder on rickrungood.com. This is technically still in beta, but about to remove that label, about to make a, a pretty sizable update, which I think you guys will enjoy. But right now, I absolutely love this thing. So uh, what we have been doing and what we've been doing pretty successfully is the last 24 rounds. I think that's a good way to go. Now, Torrey Pines, what do we know? Both U.S. Opens and Torrey Pines, what did we say? Uh, strokes gained putting and driving accuracy have been strong correlators. So... Let's act like it. 25%. No, I can't do that. That's so many. 20 on putting, 20 on accuracy. Maybe 25 on accuracy. Maybe I should go more on putting. I'm just scared. I'm just terrified of it. Uh, then let's do kind of a modified uh, strokes gain total here, and we'll do 15 on the ball striking categories and 10 around the green. That leaves us with 15 remaining. Uh, I think we have to give a nod to the distance, guys. If you can be accurate and, well... Yeah, okay, let's do 10 on distance and then our last five on birdie or better. Let's, I got the last 24 rounds in here. Let's sort this by value. And oh boy, Abraham Answer is my number one golfer. It's always terrifying when a guy you didn't talk about in the last 40 minutes pops up as number one because he gains strokes off the tee. He's accurate. He plays out of the fairway. Oh, man. Rom's number two. That makes me feel better. Kokrak is three. Xander is four. Fitzpatrick, five. Simpson, six. Spieth, Scotty Scheffler, Colin Morikawa, Paul Casey. Oh, my gosh. I cannot. I mean, these are guys I didn't even talk about. Oh, no. Now what? Um, I wonder. I don't want to change the model because that's what I would have built. And obviously, it's very early in the week. I can continue to, to tweak this. But here's. I guess here's my homework. Go look further at Abraham Answer. Go look further at Jason Kokrak. Uh, the rest, I guess, I'm okay with. Paul Casey, I should probably consider him a little bit, a little bit harder. Um, so I've got my, I've got homework cut out for me. I just gave myself a little bit of homework here. Uh, but hopefully, you can tweak your model. You can determine what's important to you, and maybe we'll rerun another one of these on the Wednesday live chat. Um, but that'll do it for now. U.S. Open DFS preview in the books. Thank you all very much for joining me. I'm absolutely stoked about it. You can tweet me what you think, at Rick Rungood, or you can leave a comment below. Best of luck this week, and I'll talk to you guys soon.